Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to BC308, our course on Revelation. And Daniel, thank you for connecting to the class. We are um, journeying through Revelation, uh, reading scripture portion by portion and uh, looking at uh, what we could draw from the scriptures. Let's take a moment to pray, please, and we will get started. We may request somebody in the class to pray with all of us. Okay, let's pray. Go ahead, Abhinas. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, beautiful morning, Lord. This time, Father God, we come to you, Lord Jesus. And as we go through the book of Revelation, Father God, we ask you that more of your revelation and understanding, Father God, to help us to understand, Father God, your insights, Lord Jesus. And as we're here, Father God, we submit Pastor Asis, Lord, be with him, Lord Jesus, Father God, at his, as he is teaching, Father God. Give him a new revelations, Father God. And we submit all of the students to your mighty hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right, so we were in Revelation chapter 2. And um, we had actually read... Um, the first seven verses, uh, the church in Ephesus. And um, we were in the end of that, um, looking at verses six and seven, when we kind of, um, in a little hurried way, uh, closed our last lecture. So let's just quickly review a few things uh, about the church in Ephesus, and then bring that to a close, uh, just look at verses six and seven, and then we will move forward. So we said, uh, as the Lord was giving his message to the church in Ephesus, he had a lot of good things to say about them. Uh, the Lord is moving among the candlesticks, he's moving among the churches, and he is looking at what's happening in every local church and every local community and to this church in Ephesus he he, he commends them he said of, of good things you know I know your works they were very diligent people they were enduring through hardship uh, they were people who are very discerning uh, they were testing out the false prophets and uh, they were even uh, you know they were discerning this particular group called the Nicolaitans and, and and they were rejecting them. So, okay, you know, we cannot associate with them. So they were very spiritually discerning. They were also very uh, determined. They, uh, 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 you know, they had persevered and so on. But but in the process of all of that, something happened. Which the only the, the which the Lord could see, and the Lord pointed out. He said, "You have left your first love." So it's not that they didn't have their first love. That means, you know, they loved the Lord, but they had left their place of doing the first works, of focusing on Jesus. So that's why the Lord says, I need you to repent, and I need you to do the first works. So there is repentance, uh, that is accompanied by works. That means our actions are demonstrating our change of heart and mind, our repentance. So first works are important. Uh, doing the first things that are most important. So when we said first love, we said you know priority, first in time, first in devotion, uh, first in, um, in in giving the Lord what He is to and worship and. Uh, seeking him. So he says, do the first works. And then, of course, he, he didn't tell them not to do the things they were doing. All of those things were good. So this was a very strong message because it comes with a very strong warning. He says, if you don't do that, 
I will remove your candlestick from its place. Now that's very serious. Um, when a candlestick basically is saying, as a local church, because the candlestick represents the local church, as a local church, you will not have a place in my presence. That is very serious, right? So um, we were, you know, discussing a little bit last week on how, as a community, we need to maintain that, right? That uh, uh, as a community, of course, we are going to be engaged in ministry. We are going to be engaged in, you know, doing the things God's called us to do. But while we're doing that, we must not miss out. We must not leave our first love, and we must not stop doing the first works. That's important. So the last uh, point that we were dealing with was was six, was a six and seven, where he says, you know, uh, that this church they had uh, the church in Ephesus they had recognized the this group called the Nicolaitans. So this was a particular uh, group, or you could call it a sect of people. Um, it's not much is known about them other than what we can infer. Uh, we can infer just from the name Nicolaitans uh, uh, that this was a just from the meaning of the name that this was a group of people where the laity was suppressed, the laity was put down, and and so that's one of the things. And then we also see later on that they were engaged in immorality, idolatry, and things like that. So. This particular sect, they were not, uh, no, so the church and the officials were very, very discerning. They didn't let these people infiltrate into the church, and so the Lord com commends them for that as well. And then he promises them, verse 7, that for overcoming, they're going to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So this is, again, a very interesting verse because we see the tree of life, which we read about we read about in uh, the Garden of Eden, and we again read about in Revelation 22, the tree of life, which is for the healing or the longevity of the nations. It doesn't mean, you know, um, that tree is, is it's its source, but God is the source of health and healing and longevity, but he gives the, an expression to it through a natural means, uh, the tree of life. And that is in the midst of the paradise of God. So paradise is in heaven now, as before, uh, in contrast to paradise before the cross. Before the cross, paradise was in the lower parts of the earth, also known as Abraham's bosom. It was a compartment of, of uh, the lower part of the earth, hell. Um, so one side was paradise or Abraham's bosom, where the saints were, the saints, the Old Testament saints were temporarily held. And when the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven, he took them into heaven. So paradise was transferred into heaven. And so in the New Testament, I mean, after the cross in the New Testament, whenever there's paradise referenced, it is always in heaven. And here's one example in the midst of the paradise of God. Okay. Any questions about the church in Ephesians before we move forward? Okay, so let's read verses 8 through 11, please. Somebody could read it. Revelation 2, 8 through 11. Can I read the question? Please. To the angel of the church in Ephesus read the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Uh, chapter 2, verse 8 through 11, please. Okay. And to the angel of the church in Sicilia write, the words of the first and the last who died came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and not, but are synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some, some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of love. He who has in your written here what the Spirit says to the churches. 
the one who conquers will not be cursed by the second death. Mm. Thank you. So, to the church in Smyrna, the Lord recognizes some things. He knows that um, they are in a place where they are being heavily persecuted. And in spite of the persecution, they are continuing to serve the Lord. So he says, um, verse 9, I know your works, but then look at it. There is tribulation, there is poverty, and they are being blasphemed. So there is a synagogue of, uh, there, are, there is a group of Jewish people who the Lord calls them as the synagogue of Satan. A synagogue simply means an assembly, a group, a gathering of people. Uh, so these people, um, they are claiming to be Jews, but the Lord just says, no, no, they are actually a group of people who are empowered by Satan. And this, that group is blaspheming against or speaking against the church there. So the church in Smyrna was, you know, what we would call a persecuted church. They were uh, in tribulation, they were facing blasphemy, and they were also, you know, they were not very well to do. It says the poverty, meaning they didn't have too much materially. But he says, spiritually, you're rich. Spiritually, you have it, have a lot. And in spite of that, they were a church who were serving. So this is one of the two churches. One of the, so basically, uh, two of the church, two of the seven churches. He doesn't call to repent. The church in Smyrna, and the church in uh, Philadelphia. So to the church in Smyrna, he says. Um, don't be afraid of what these people are going to do to you. So there's this group whom the Lord calls a, an assembly of Satan. This, this whole group is empowered by the devil, and uh, they are blaspheming. And he says, look, he's, he's telling them, they're going to come and put some of you into prison. And uh, for 10 days, you will, be, you will have tribulation 10 days. So this could be literally literal 10 days, or could be just a reference to a short period of time. Uh, we don't know for sure. But he says, just be faithful till death, and I will give you the crown of life. And notice how, how he begins in verse 8. He says, I am the one who was dead and came to life. And then he's calling them to be faithful to death, and I will give you the crown of life. You see the connection between who he declares himself to be and the reward or the promise that he makes to the church. I conquered death. I will give you a crown of life. You be faithful unto death. So that's very important for us, right? When we, when we want to have conviction about something, we need to look to the Lord himself. Who is that? That he is the one who conquered death, who is alive. And therefore, we have the conviction, the assurance of the crown of life. So we just have to be faithful to Jesus, even unto death, knowing we will receive a crown of life because the one whom we are faithful to, he is the one who has conquered death. And he has come, he came back to life. So the church in Smyrna, there's a very short. Um, passage about it, I think that good things for us to take away, which is that in spite of the persecution, they were working, they were serving, they were walking and living for Jesus. Now, what is interesting, which we will notice um, when compared in contrast to the church in Philadelphia is, and I just want you to think about this, in Revelation 3, 9, chapter 3, verse 9, when the Lord is speaking to the church in Philadelphia, he says to them, 
you also have you're also facing a synagogue of Satan meaning an assembly of people who are attacking them so there also he mentions synagogue of Satan assembly of people empowered by the devil they're attacking the you know they're coming against the church but very interesting to the church in Philadelphia he says I will make them come and bow at your feet Revelation chapter 3 verse 9 he says, I'll make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and, not, and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. So I want us to think about this. There are two churches, Smyrna, church in Philadelphia. They are both facing opposition from this group of people who are attacking them and the Lord calls them both he calls them the assembly of Satan or assembly of the devil they're both attacking but in the case of Smyrna this synagogue of Satan is doing harm uh, uh, that is in Revelation 2 verse 10 he says some of you will be put into prison and you're going to suffer and you just have to be faithful unto death to the church in Philadelphia he says I'm gonna make them come and worship at your feet and make them acknowledge that I have loved you that's Revelation 3 and verse 9 now this is kind of perplexing Say, Lord, uh, two churches, they're your people. One is in Smyrna, one's in Philadelphia. They're facing this same kind of opposition. But why is it that one church suffers and another church seems to be in dominion? One church, these people are coming and attacking and putting them into prison and maybe some of them are killed and here's another church and those people are coming and bobbing at their feet why is there this difference any thoughts Um, you understood the question? Um, Pastor? Yes, go ahead. It's a very good observation that just came to my attention now, even though I've read this before. Uh, but the only thing that could come to my mind is maybe because the churches are in different regions. So what's what uh, the church in Smyrna is facing is peculiar to the region they find themselves and uh, that of Philadelphia is different that that's the only thing that could come to my mind mm -hmm. good anyone else go ahead please sir when you were sharing about it the only thing that comes to my mind is because it's the sovereignty of God. It's different in different places. I don't. I I cannot give. I'm not able to come to a reason why it's like that. One mm. place and another. <laughs> only the. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Sir. Anyone else? Thank you. No one else? Kennedy has uh, put in the chat lack of faith. Anything else? Why is it different? You know, two churches. The Lord Jesus loves both. Um, mm, why could there be this? So, Tesha, the question was uh, we're comparing uh, Smyrna, the church in Smyrna, with the church in Philadelphia, uh, both of them, this is comparing Revelation 2, 
verse 10 and Revelation 3 verse 9, both of them are facing opposition by a similar kind of community called, uh, I mean, they, these are people who are claiming to be Jews, but the Lord Jesus is just, uh, calls both of these groups as uh, groups of Satan. So both these churches, both these local churches are facing opposition. But what we are saying, what we are seeing is, one church is suffering. The church in Smyrna, Revelation 2.10, this group comes and puts some of them in prison, maybe even up to death. Whereas in the church in Philadelphia, Revelation 3.9, the Lord is saying, I will make them come and bow at your feet, so that they will know I have loved you. So we are trying to understand, you know, why is why would there be this difference of different people are sharing their thoughts? Please go ahead, uh, say and Abney. Another thing that I would tie to what Sister Rupa mentioned was, uh, she said the sovereign will could also be the purpose of the church. I, I know it's something difficult for us to, or even myself saying it, it's difficult to say that a church was raised for the purpose to show how to stand trials even unto death. Um, could it be that the church was raised for that purpose and God wants to do something through that church to show them uh, what it means to stand until that. And then for the church in Philadelphia, God wants to show his power over Satan and all those who um, are devising ways to bring down the church and going against them. So it could just be the purpose of God for these churches and we that, that we're seeing play out in scripture here. Mm. That's another angle I could come from. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you, Avni. <laughs> As I'm reading the passage, Pastor, I found this verse 10 for the Church of Smyrna. It says that uh, you are about to suffer, but uh, you may be tested. So uh, they are uh, they have to go through their test to prove their obedience and their love for Lord. But on the other side, uh, for Philadelphia, he, he says, you have kept my word, I have not denied my name. So I think they've already been through the test and they have come out... Uh, victorious overcomers and then also he says in verse 10 because you have kept my command to persevere i will keep you from the hour of trial so uh, there is a time of testing which they have already been through they've tested and they have uh, overcome and for them it is yet to be done that's my observation probably mm. very good good observation good christopher Prabhakar? Yes, Pastor. Uh, uh, the, the Church of Smyrna uh, was the second church and uh, it was uh, heavy, heavily persecuted during the time. Um, uh, and both the churches were in, uh, there was a lot of time difference between these churches' establishments as well. So uh, the Smyrna Church was the second church after the Ephesus, uh, the Apostolic Church. So People were so much into the so much into the godliness that time, but uh, due to the spread of uh, Christianity that time, uh, Romans were used to persecute the, the people of Smyrna, the Church of Smyrna, a lot, and they stood uh, through the persecution, and some of them had given their lives as it as the martyrdom, and then the Church of Philadelphia is almost coming to the sixth church. Um, where almost people had gone through many um, trials and temptations, they stood by it, and um, and in other um, uh, ways, like the Church of uh, uh, Philadelphia is called the Judgment Hour Church, where people have to be uh, strict to their, uh, their their roots, and God said that I will open a door which no one will close. So there might be um, the opportunity that most of the Christians during that time in the philadelphia one where um, uh, learn a lot from their previous churches and and uh, i guess their strength come from their uh, their ancestors and also um they they were more uh, spiritually uh, mature and saw all the things um, early, as compared to the people of smyrna so i think uh, 
the, the comparison between the second church and the sixth church was was uh, just because of uh, the time zones they were into and the, the kind of the kind of environmental uh, issues or political issues or, or the government changes and uh, many things uh, they went through so uh, that is one of the main uh, cultural or historical differences between the smyrna and philadelphia i guess past thank you um so how much time difference was there between smyrna and philadelphia smyrna um was like uh, established uh 180 to 313 80 uh 180 to 313 80 and uh, but, uh, when was john living john was exactly a pastor john so when was the book of revelation written AD 90 uh, approximately so how could you say smyrna was 313 AD? Pastor, it was like I went into researches and all that. So some yeah, of, so that uh, research is wrong. Okay, okay. Remember, in chapter one, when mm -hmm. we began this whole study, yes, sir. We said we should not do exactly what you're saying. Mm. We said that when we began Revelation, you know, based on Revelation one nineteen, the Lord Jesus told John, write the things which are. So these seven churches were existing in John's time. And I did mention that you will find a lot of writings where people have taken these seven churches and extrapolated them to refer to seven time periods, which is wrong. Okay, Pastor. Thank you. The seven churches were there during John's time. That means they were all there at the same time during AD 19. So John is speaking to them. The Lord is speaking to them through John. They were existing right there at the same time. Right. So we shouldn't. I mean, at least I would. I would suggest not to adopt this. I mean, there are a lot of books, a lot of things. Right. And you can't just accept everything. You have to reason. You have to think. We shouldn't accept people who. You know, Revelation 119. The Lord is saying. Right to these churches, not right to seven time periods. Right to these seven churches. These were literal churches at that time. So they were all there at the same time. In fact, they were established. Um, you know, Paul established the church in Ephesus, Acts 19, and he trained people. And we know, you know, these seven churches, along with church in Colossae, church in, you know, they were all. In the vicinity, you know, so uh, they were all there. And these seven churches are all there, and very close to each other. The people who were pastoring, leading the churches, or who helped plant the churches, were most likely trained by the Apostle Paul during that time. So that's the history which we discussed in chapter one. Okay, uh, but thanks, thanks, thank, thank you for thank sharing. You. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. So yeah. Much. Um, so, Chris, yeah, Christopher, you were going to say something. Uh, yes, uh, Pastor. I was actually quite similar to what, what the other people were saying, uh, but uh, one of the things I did notice was that, or uh, I inferred basically from um, from the church in Philadelphia, is that uh, you know they had the right attitude, and they were they were they were doing good works, which um, uh, which God recognized and therefore you know he was sort of uh, helping them in this in this process of you know uh, dealing with uh, uh you know with whatever tribulations that that they were facing so yeah the right attitude i think was was there and also the the works that they were doing mm -hmm. okay so i see the comments in the chat um uh, uh pratik shared their level of understanding asha writes they were not keen to keep the word and also lack of knowledge. Maxon shares obedience and faith to the church before God. Kung Belu, maybe strength, ability, but the one know her. Uh, the, uh, the church of Philadelphia kept the word, kept the command. Yeah. So good. I know. I just want to thank everyone. Thank you for all sharing all your thoughts. And you know, that's the whole point here to just look at all the 
all the uh, you know the perspectives that we can bring now obviously uh, it is not stated here uh, you know, the lord is not saying because of this and because of that you know it's not explicitly stated so uh, we should just try to draw what we can from the information that's given and was uh, about the church in smyrna about the church in philadelphia now there is no variableness on the side of god that means on the lord's side the head of the church he has no favorites right he loves the church in smyrna as much as he loves the church in philadelphia or ephesus or any other location he loves them equally there is no you know favoritism there's no variableness from god's side so the variables would be on our side right here on earth and obviously there 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 is some very you know we would just i'll just use the term variables uh, there are some variables that are causing this difference in experience uh, between the two churches, even though they are facing somewhat a similar opposition, that basically the opposition is coming from he in both the cases he mentions a group of people who are calling themselves Jews, but they are actually empowered by Satan. Right. So uh, what we do know is that there were Jewish brethren, Jewish people, many people Judaizers, who were attacking the Christians. We know that. So the primary opponents were the Judaizers, the people from the, the, the Jewish people who attacked, you know, and we know historically people like Saul and others, they attacked the believers. So the church, both these churches are facing opposition from a synagogue of Satan. These people are actually in part of the devil. So the variables are on our side. Now we don't know for sure, but I think all the observations that were shared here were very good. And if if I were to put it in one sentence, I would just say that the churches were in a different spiritual level or spiritual state, right? Uh, 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 they were in a different spiritual state. One, uh, uh, they were there at the same time. They were there at the, you know, during the time John was writing, 1890. They must all have been started between AD, early 60s, to now it's early 90s, so they, they, these churches would have been about 30 years of age, 30 years old. You say, how do you know that? Because Paul, the apostle Paul, on his third missionary journey, which was around, which was the early part of 80, 60, 80, you know, uh, he was on his third missionary journey when he came to Ephesus and he started the church in Ephesus. He spent three years there. So we know the church in Ephesus was planted sometime in early 60, AD 60, here we are AD 90 when John is writing, so about 30 years. And these other churches all started around the same time. So these all these churches about 30 years into their spiritual journey, but they're in a different spiritual level. That means 30 years have elapsed. All these seven churches have existed for approximately 30 years. But they're in a spiritual, they're in a different spiritual level. As we will compare, we can compare all the seven churches. You know, as we re, once we read all of them, you can contrast. Hey, they're all they they all were planted during the apostolic time. Paul and you know the people he trained. So they all lived out of approximately the same duration of time, but spiritually, they're in a different place. Some are in a very bad spiritual place, like we will see the church in uh, Laodicea, the church in, uh, uh, in uh, Sardis. They're not in a very good spiritual place. But some of them are in a good spiritual place. Church in uh, Philadelphia, they're in a place of authority and dominion. So the spiritual journey they have made, uh, it, uh, it, it contributes to the variables th that we can see. Now, the observations that you've different ones we have made, you know, in terms of attitude, the terms of them having endured testing, uh, demonstrating the commitment to God and the Word of God, uh, and uh, you know, uh, 
holding on, enduring, and all of the different things. I think all of those are very important, but those are what bring us into a different spiritual level in contrast to that would have brought the church in Philadelphia to a different spiritual level in contrast to the church in Smyrna, which existed about the same time, but the Lord said, okay, you need to go, you have to go through this, you've got to be tested. Right, so that's what we can aim for. And, I, and I'm not saying that this is, you know, chapter and verse because it's not given for us, but I think it's good to think through and say, okay, you know, what is it? Is there can be differences between local church communities, even though they've all existed the same period for the same duration of time, spiritually they're in a different place, and therefore, you know, you're seeing what they're going through. Uh, that doesn't mean that the Lord loves anyone any less than the other, right? On God's side, there is no variation. On our side, we are making a spiritual journey, and so there are differences. Okay? So, let's go to, uh, I know we've spent a lot more time than I wanted. Go ahead, say, please. Thank you, Pastor. I was just wondering, in relation to what you're seeing now, is is there can we observe something about how Jesus Christ introduces himself to each church? He introduces himself to each church differently. So does this tie into what you said? The dimension to which a church grows is to which the Lord would manifest himself because he introduces himself differently as related to whether it's an issue or whether it's um it's this, uh, it's something they are doing good or doing well. So I don't know if that ties into what you're saying, sir. Yeah, the, we, we can observe that, definitely. We can observe that as, um, and that's a good observation to make, like how the Lord introduces himself to each local church. Um, it is in, do you see a correlation between how his introduction to either what he observes in them or what he's calling them to do? You know, so for example, uh, when he introduces himself to the church in Ephesus, he's saying, "Look, I am like the invigilator. You know, I'm the one who's looking at everything, and I'm watching what's going on." You know, so in other words, he's saying, "Look, you've got everything good, but I can see beyond that. I can see where you are spiritually. You've left your first love." You know, so he kind of introduces himself that way uh, to the church, like we just mentioned, the church in Smyrna is saying, "Look." I'm the giver of life. So even if you have to die, hey, you know that you're going to get a crown of life. So there is a correlation uh, in how the Lord introduces himself to each church and what they're going through. Okay, let's try to move faster. I just uh, uh, spent too much time here. Um, Revelation chapter 2, let's move please to verses 12 through 17. Three verses each, please. Somebody could read. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where, the, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast my name and did not, did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, which you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to and to commit sexual immor immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has a ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Mm, thank you. So, I just want to bring our attention to another aspect, the issue of doctrine 
or doctrine is a uh, old English word for teaching. You know, what do we teach? What the the doctrine? In these two churches, that is the uh, the church in Pergamos, which we are looking at right now, as well as the church in Thyatira, we see the Lord highlighting the importance of doctrine and the effect of doctrine on the local church in both these you know for both these churches it's very really interesting if you look everywhere he says doctrine doctrine or teaching if you underline that you'll see he talks a lot about that and you find that to to the church in pergamos he says, you know, again, this is a church that is living in a very difficult city. Jesus says, it is, uh, verse 13, it's, it's where Satan's throne is. I mean, in this city, in Pergamos, Satan is having so much of influence. He's got his throne there. Very difficult city. And there are cities like that. Uh, where uh, there is so much of demonic influence. And this per Pergamos was one of those. Uh, and Jesus just recognizes, you know, Satan's got his throne there in that city. And, uh, but still, the believers there, they are holding on to the word of the Lord Jesus. And uh, one of them was even martyred and killed among them. So, you know, but they are facing persecution or threat to their life. They're living in a very uh, demonic city, a city where Satan has his throne. Now, in such a kind of a city, what would be Satan's strategy? You can understand that in such a kind of a city, Satan would try to infiltrate the church through doctrine, wrong doctrine. And Jesus points out two kinds of wrong doctrines during that time which this church the church in Pergamos had to defend itself against he says there is there are those who are do, teaching the doctrine of Balaam basically there was this teaching that was saying you know it's okay to eat things offered to idols and to commit immorality that's Jesus referring to it, that teaching as the doctrine of Balaam. Then there is was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We, we mentioned that in the earlier church, church in Smyrna, the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Again, uh, just by the name Nicolaitans. Nico means to have a thought dominion, Latians, the laity, so to have authority on the laities. You know what people interpret this particular group to be as, yes. um, and Jesus says, "I hate this." You know, very strong words, verse fifteen: "The doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate." So there is certain doctrine or kinds of teaching that Jesus says, "I hate that kind of teaching." In this particular case, going by the name of the group, it was a teaching that would suppress the laity. And uh, he, he also says here, this doctrine of Balaam. So the problem with the church in Pergamos is they let these doctrines creep into the church. Because he says, verse 14, I have a few things against you. Chapter 2, verse 14. In other words, you didn't guard yourself against it. You should have, of course. You, you should have. You know, you should have protected the church from this, but it's come in. And therefore he's saying, look, I, I got this against you. And he calls them to repent. Otherwise, I'm going to speak my doctrine, my word. It's very interesting, as we saw, as you mentioned earlier, how he introduces himself to the church, right? He says, look, I've got a sharp to it, a sword in my hand, meaning I am also somebody who speaks, speaking my word. My word is a double-edged sword. What was their problem? They were letting the wrong words come in, 
and he's saying, if you don't repent, I'm going to speak my word, right? And this time, this word is going to not just, you know, the double-edged sword can be a blessing, set you free, or the double-edged sword can penetrate and, and, and bring about judgment, because it says, I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The people who have come in who are causing all these problems, you know, so it's going to be shaking in that particular congregation because the Lord is going to start judging these people who have somehow come in to the congregation and they are, they have infiltrated that congregation with this wrong teaching. So he says, you overcome, you're going to eat the manna, the good food, the spiritual food that I'm going to give and a new name. So, What can we take away from this? We have to, as I'm talking about in sense of a local church, we have to protect the local church from people who bring in, because that's what ultimately happened. You know, uh, 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 verse 16, I will fight against them, or the people who held on to this doctrine, who came in. So we have to protect. So in those days, it was the doctrine of Balaam. It was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Today, here we are in the 21st century. There are other kinds of doctrine. So can you imagine, uh, you, know, uh, you know, wrong kinds of doctrine. People are bringing it in. And if the church today embraces that, the Lord is going to speak to us the same way. He says, look, I hate that. I hate that doctrine or that kind of teaching because it's not aligned to who he is. It's not aligned to his teaching. The right teaching comes from his mouth. The sword comes from his mouth. His word is what should be filling his church. But then when we permit wrong things to come in, then he says, look, then I will need to judge these people. They'll be shaking in the church, and uh, that's going to be painful uh, at that time. Any thoughts, any questions on this? Okay. So let's please um, take a quick break. Um, and we need to pick up a little speed. Uh, let's try to finish um, chapter 3. Uh, yeah, I mean, finish from chapter 2, verse 18 to, if we can do till end of chapter 3, that will be good. Let's try it, okay? So I'll come back in 10 minutes and uh, go forward. Thank you. <laughs> 